Welcome to today's program, and I thank you for joining us. I am C. Virginia Fields, former Manhattan Borough President, and currently the President and CEO of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, Inc. Mission of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS is to educate, mobilize, and empower black leaders to meet the challenge of fighting HIV AIDS and other health disparities in their local communities. And on today's show, we will discuss the impact of prevention as it is in alignment with Governor Cuomo's blueprint to end AIDS by 2020. We specifically will look at the impact that it has on communities of color. And I am pleased to have three very special guests with me. Coyote Lee Grayson, professional vocalist and stage hand. Nicole Cobb, entertained Nico, not Nico, but Nico Cobb, entertained musician and singer, East Coast inspiration singers. And they both are members of the Rivers of Living Waters Church right here in New York City, in Manhattan. And I think the pastor is Vanessa Brown. Vanessa Brown. Yes. And we're also pleased to be joined by Mathuri Ja, who has a master's in public health, and she is also a licensed social worker with a master's in social work. And we are very pleased to have all three of them. But before we go to them, I just want to give you a few facts about HIV. HIV most adversely affects communities of color in the United States with blacks and African Americans, particularly young black men who have sex with men, MSMs, and black transgender women representing the category of largest, the largest number of individuals, rather, who are living with the virus. Between 2008 and 2011, young MSMs had the greatest percentage increase in new infections. An estimated 58% of young men who have sex with men living with infection were black. And young black men who have sex with men also experience the largest increase in newly diagnosed infection among all racial ethnic groups. That's why it is so important that we understand that still today, while there's a great deal of complacency about HIV, it is still alive and well and predominantly in impacting black African Americans. Also, we're going to talk today about PrEP. Now, many are not familiar with PrEP, but it stands for Pre-Exposure Prophylactis, or P-R-E-P, -E PrEP. This is a way for people who do not have HIV, but are at substantial risk in order to prevent HIV injection by taking a pill a day. And I want everyone to understand that PrEP is not 100% effective one can still become infected with HIV, especially if one does not have enough medicine in their bodies to fight off the virus. In different studies, people taking PrEP were 44% to 75% less likely to become infected uh, from HIV than in comparison to other groups. And those who took PrEP consistently were up to 92% less likely to contract HIV. So here today, we will discuss both of these topics, and I thank my uh, guests for being here. And before we start, let me just say, because we have a regular viewing audience, and we have addressed over the past couple of shows the governor's plan to significantly reduce the number of new HIV infections here in the state of New York by the year of 2020 from its current rate of 3,000 annually to 750. And we talked about this plan having three major goals. One is to get people tested. People need to be tested and know their status. 
in persons who may get tested or diagnosed with HIV, the second major step is to get them linked to care, get them into care, and to retain them in care so that their viral load is suppressed significantly to prevent the further transmission of HIV. So, and the third major step really focus on an area that the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS is uh, very much involved with, and that's prevention. And that's the whole discussion around PrEP, now a medication that one can take once a day, and it has been shown to be effective in terms of preventing the transmission of HIV up to at least 92% cases. But there are other factors and other behaviors that go along with that as recommended by the Center for Disease Control. So with that as a backdrop, I really want us to have a discussion, certainly with those of you who are here today, because of your experiences and because of what you're doing in this fight Let's talk a little, uh, starting with um, Coyote and Nico, about some of uh, what you are experiencing or your awareness about the large number of certainly young black MSMs and transgender persons, male and females, having the highest rate in terms of new infections, why do you think that these populations are most at risk? I would say um, lack of community. Definitely lack of community, um, lack of support, um, the stigma attached to HIV and the HIV epidemic, um, many different variables. Um, I guess speaking from personal experience, um, just homelessness, that, that can be a very dangerous place. Um, and I guess I can more so speak from there because that's something that I went through off and on and, and also coming in contact with other black and Hispanic LGBT youth that were homeless and how many of them are putting themselves in very compromised situations in order to try to kind of make it through the day. Um, I think that that is a big serious ordeal, the homelessness. You know, I'm so glad to hear you say that because quite often when we have discussions and look at issues that might impact especially young uh, persons, uh, gay population, we don't hear that a lot and that is so critical because if one does not have a home, they have no place to consistently take medication or even to possibly uh, look to get support. So that's a very important issue that you've introduced. And uh, Coyote, what do you think? Some of the uh, reasons why um, the experiences of this population are consistently most at risk. Well, I definitely agree with everything that Nico has said. Um, I've also been through my own experience of homelessness in DC and in New York. But along with those factors, being around youth, I had the opportunity to work in a nonprofit organization in both cities, DC and New York. And I was around an age group, even at the age of 19, I was around an age group from the age of 13 to about 24. And all of the people, most of the people that I worked with, I found not only were they going through a homeless situation or going from couch to couch, but you know, they were in a situation where they didn't have any support from their family or they, they didn't have anyone in their school or in their personal circle, not even a friend, to tell them their worth, you know, to, to yeah. tell them that there are places you can go to, to clean yourself, to, to get help, to get Medicaid, to get these things. You know, they're so, they were so quick to jump to uh, sleeping around to get their benefits, you know, or their coins, or what they, it's what they <laughs> call it, that to them, that was their survival mode. That, that's mm -hmm. what they're taught. Yeah, I, I feel like it's what we learn once we're forced to be in survival mode, and it's what we learn when we're around uneducated people our age that carries us for our late teenage years through our 20s, and then puts us in a, a, a status of statistics. So, and as one uh, Mothery who's doing a lot in terms of reviewing the literature, uh, working in terms of evaluating programs, how consistent with uh, what you're reading and learning, how consistent is that in terms of what uh, Nico and Coyote have said with terms of why some of these populations continue to be at risk? It's 100% on point. Um, I mean, historically, 
members of the LGBT community have been stigmatized and discriminated against, and then historically people of color have been stigmatized and dis discriminated against. So combining those two demographic labels or whatever you want to call them just really amplify an experience of isolation. Um, and evidence is really showing a big correlation between the mental health of somebody across anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress disorder even um, with high-risk sexual behavior as a coping mechanism for a lot of different reasons. And it's actually being seen the highest in black communities where there are already extreme experiences of poverty um, or oppression or trauma and they're common. And so, you know, just offhand, black sexually marginalized men are one to more than one to two times more likely to attempt suicide than their white counterparts. Mm. And nearly half of transgender youth will have suicidal ideation in their lifetimes and one quarter will report suicide attempts. So there is a huge crisis um, and you guys are really speaking to that and it's very important to think about it in a very holistic way and see the whole picture of really what's impacting the life of a young person. So now that we know what we know, what do we do about it? What do you see as some of the most um, effective ways to approach prevention programming for youth? And the reason this discussion, again, is so important because, as I said, here in the state of New York now, we have a mandate to significantly reduce the numbers and to prevent new infections by 2020 very short period of time in five years in the life of what we're seeing now because it's nearly 35 years since the Center for Disease Control, and since you say you're 25, before you were even born, <laughs> uh, the Center for Disease Control <laughs> made it known about what HIV is. And unfortunately, when this first became a discussion nearly 35 years ago, it was presumed that it was the white gay community. So the black community was not as involved as initially as it should have been, but the black community got into it and we're in it now. So the fact that the governor has declared this mandate in terms of a turnaround here in the state of New York, I think it really gives all of us a chance to have our voices heard, to make input, to articulate and express what we think is working in terms of prevention programs especially. What isn't working related to the same population we're talking about. So in your opinion, what are some of the most effective ways or some of the ways I would say you think approaching prevention with this population would be a value? You can go. Okay. <laughs> you first this time, right? uh, Well, I have two very strong opinions on that. Uh, the, the softer opinion is we cannot be afraid. The parents, the people who are older, the people who are positive, the people who are educated, your church, your work area, we have to stop being afraid to talk about it. We have to stop being ashamed to talk about it. We have to stop shunning young people who are choosing to live life openly about their sexuality and stop putting them in a box where they're forced to survive and be homeless. Like, you, we have to talk about this. We have to take our teenagers and our youth in, you know, in their early 20s and ask them questions and be forefront about it and put it in their face because, honestly, at this age range, we are young and in love and crazy. We are not thinking about our bodies, not the way how we should be. And I feel like the people who are more educated and who are older and who we work with and, and who we live with, even our parents, <laughs> need to be a little, a lot more open about talking about it. You know, even if they don't know about, they don't have a lot of knowledge about it, they need to ask. We need to have so these discussions. So how do you address this, say, for example, in an affirming church, the role of the church, being a member of an affirming church? How are these issues being addressed uh, from that view, perspective? Uh, uh, from our, our church, um, church specifically, <laughs> they're completely radical. Yeah. Um, they're involved. This is always a, a, a consistent conversation mm -hmm. that we're all, already having in so many different ways in the church, outside the church, meetings, um, you know, board meetings, just many different than community gatherings. This is something that we're always um, in discussion about. And I feel like 
something as simple as a discussion is a is a big deal because of the comfort in that discussion it kind of translates into Trust. people yeah. not only our collective lives but our individual lives it does transfer it does come come home with us um, and having a place where I say this all comes down to love for me prevention in in, in, in this entire epidemic um, a, a big piece is love because when you can love yourself to the best of your ability you can give that love to someone else a lot of reason why these families aren't able to cherish and love and, and to nurture their, their children and to protect them and to guide them before they get into these, these crazy situations is because a lot of, a lot of us are still struggling with, with, with self-hate issues that, that translate even outside of being LGBT, that translate outside of just being a black person. It, it, it comes down to being an individual. Mm -hmm. When you can really love yourself to the best of your ability, mm -hmm. you, can, you can help someone else out. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of these parents and a lot of these communities, a lot of these organizations, even the government, a lot of people really have some, some personal issues that they need to deal with because it really does start with an individual. It takes one voice. And it's interesting, again, that you would say this because I think when I think about organizations and programs, typically we look at um, things that are less defined than love, than patience, understanding. But we look for the treatment, appeal, uh, behavior change through psychoanalysis and, you know, <laughs> things of that nature. But it is very important in terms of things as important as love. And I know uh, Mothery is very much involved in looking at, on the prevention side, PrEP which mm -hmm. I had mentioned earlier. And I'm pleased to say that she is now a new member of the staff at the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, and she is our prep specialist. So you want to talk to us a little bit about what role you see PrEP has for this population and what challenges perhaps uh, PrEP also presents right. with this population. I think it's important to know that the discussion about PrEP is really new and it's very dynamic and it's still evolving. So just like we may not have information, can only imagine what a population of people that have limited contact with people in general can have access to. Um, and I just want to reiterate what Ms. Field said earlier, that this is a drug specifically for people who are HIV negative. Um, but may be at risk for contracting the infection just based on how their lifestyle is. Um, but it comes with many caveats. PrEP is supposed to be used with, in conjunction with other regular safe sex practices. And the things that you're talking about are, are very, it's hard to get your head around if you don't have a place to sleep at night, how you're <laughs> going to regularly see a doctor, follow up, and be able to adhere to a drug. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of data at the moment because it's so new. Um, how it might be successfully used and positively used in a way that's empowering and not actually further stigmatizing for somebody who's already at risk for something. Um, that being said, it could also be very helpful. Um, I feel like in one way you can think about PrEP as a way that you're empowering yourself to take care of your health. And so when you're conscious that you're making safe decisions, you can start to influence others as well. And so I really think the issue around PrEP is going to be messaging and how are you speaking to people and informing them in a language that they actually understand. And I use the word language because mm -hmm. it's your word choice. Mm -hmm. So if I have a master's in public health, I might be able to get a lot of numbers and data and scientific jargon and understand it. But um, young people from a church where you're talking about issues that are so important, those things might not really mean very much to you. What may mean to you is things like, this is how you save your life. And so that's going to be the important piece about PrEP. And as Mblaka continues to think about how we engage our communities and spread information and awareness about the drug, it's really building a context. Um, I appreciated you saying voices and a context that brings all voices to the table. So everybody is important in this discussion. So how does the whole issue of mental health and uh, physical health as it impacts the young, especially black LGBT community mm -hmm. play into this? Because again, we don't hear enough right. about those discussions, especially around mental health. Well, you know, we had a privilege of hearing a really wonderful reverend last Friday talk about an issue of trauma and address it for what it really is. Um, and, you know, there's a concept called intersectionality 
which basically says you have to look at every facet of negativity somebody might be feeling as it relates to what their identity makeup is. And so that includes race, that includes your class, that includes your gender preference, that includes being LGBTQ or straight or whatever it is, what religion you are and how they all contribute to your experience. Um, and the mental health piece it has to be, it can't be an elephant in the room is what's really important. And I think yeah. that you were saying earlier too about the whole conversation, it just cannot, yeah, right. we have to hit it on and have conversations have and mental yeah. health is a part of and that. And I think when you actually look at something like suicide, um, those are lives being lost. What were those numbers you gave again on the suicide? Uh, uh, that um, black sexually marginalized men, uh -huh. so men who would have sex with other men, are one to two times more likely to attempt suicide than their white sure. counterparts. So that's a, that's a gay white man. And then nearly half of transgender youth will think about suicide in their lifetimes, and one quarter of them will actually attempt on their life. And that's a lot of loss of life. Um, and you have to see it as saving lives. And I think that's what we're trying to start this discussion around, is that the, the concept of saving life can relate to everybody. Mm -hmm. You wanted to say something? I would <laughs> say that that, that definitely um, ties into, I guess, the benefit of having an affirming church. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you're told that you're an abomination, right. from that point on, your entire identity is being crafted around that idea. Yeah. And if you walking through life thinking that you're an abomination, then is your life really that valuable? If you're already mentally believing in your heart and soul now, because of the church, has told you that you're an abomination and that your soul is damned to hell, then why really care about your life if you already know your ultimate end is going to be eternal damnation? Mm -hmm. And so that's where it translates now into the love, because then how can you love yourself, viewing yourself as an abomination, or as the, the ultimate sinner out of all sins, and then you expect me to take prep, you expect me to take pep, you expect me to, take, uh, to work mm -hmm. out, you expect me to really care about myself, but I've already been told that my eternal soul is already damned because I am who I am and I realize that there's no escaping that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, really, it's, it's really unfortunate for people who are not in these, these communities where they can live out their, their, their truest identity and it's always attached to their spirituality because in my belief, we are spirit. So because we don't have, and we probably will, not in the near future anyway, have enough affirming churches <laughs> as there need to be, yeah. what do you recommend in terms of what some of our agencies, organizations can do to better address the needs of the populations, especially young people we're talking about now? Other than getting involved with the active affirming churches that are around, I think it's really important to create your own workshops and projects where you can reach out to the schools, colleges, homeless shelters, or even a, a main street like 96th Street or 125th Street in Harlem. You know, when you have, if you have the, the resources to create something that attracts the attention of people, you know, just for them to step over to your little booth and say, hi, you know, what do you have here? It looks so pretty. You know, if you have something that can attract the people, even on a Saturday, you have a light that can reach many, many youth, especially youth, because youth are bored. We are bored, and we look for places Definitely. to go and be ourselves and express and, you know, be comfortable. But we're not going to have that unless the churches and these organizations take the initiative to create a safe space, whether it's a carnival or, I don't know, a workshop on a Saturday or a Sunday where we're just coming in for a breakfast, you know, before we go to church. Mm -hmm. Those little things really do count because mm -hmm. if you got, if you can feed them, they will listen to yes, you. Yes, they will. Right. They sure will. Any further thoughts, uh, another on them? Yeah, I just want to echo their thoughts and say, um, really, what has been shown to be most mm -hmm. effective is when you have youth leaders actually be the ones at the forefront of the movement and. Um, be the ones who are forming opinions for their peers and influencing them and actually taking a stand. There are some amazing groups that are already doing that work and I think that that's a huge piece of it because it's, it's like you said, young people will listen to other young people when they have an opportunity to come together to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think the only other piece I want to say is, um, you know, Blaca works to empower faith-based and community-based organizations 
um, to build a safety net for people who are at risk. But the reason that we do that is because we're recognizing that the community and religion and family and all these things are at the roots of the lives of the people that we serve the most. And, and that's a reality. And so there is a lot of potential for not only affirming churches, but for us to generate the kind of change that we would like to see when we go straight to the community and ask the community, how do we, how do you want this to look and how do you want this to be a positive safe exactly. for your children and for your families, et cetera. And let me say to you, this has been very enlightening and I wish we had more time, but we don't. Because <laughs> you have raised some key issues, but most of all, I think that you have certainly established the fact that prevention is so incredibly important. Yeah. So as we all move forward in terms of working on the governor's blueprint, and our plan to significantly reduce the number of new uh, rates, cases of HIV by 2020, it's up to us to make sure that prevention does not get lost in this three-step process. So we will be calling upon you again to come back with us, but I think that you have certainly given our viewers a great deal to think about talk about, and I can assure you that at the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, we will certainly be looking forward to talking with you more. You. So thank I want you. to thank my guests for joining me uh, today on this very important discussion about HIV prevention in communities of color, the black LGBTQ experience, and my guest, Martha, Martha Rija, Coyote Lee Grayson and Nicole Cobb have all added much to this discussion. And for more information on this subject and issues related to our work on HIV AIDS and other health disparities, please visit NBLCA's website at www.nblca.org or look for us on Facebook and Twitter. The Manhattan Neighborhood Network brings these programs to you to better inform you, the viewer, about the important issues that impact your health and well-being. So please let your family, friends, and neighbors know about this program. And once again, I'm C. Virginia Fields, and I thank you for joining us and hope you'll tune in next time for In Blackers Health Action TV here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.